Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, today, we will be um, presenting this panel called Pandemic Parallels, Reimagining Disability. Um, and just wanted to let you all know that this meeting will be recorded um, as well as closed captioned before being posted to the Disability Studies Minor website, um, which we'll be, we will be sending out to you all um, post meeting. My name is Amy Baguadia, and I am a graduating UCLA Disability Studies minor, and today I will be your moderator for this panel. This panel discussion will consist of predetermined questions for our three wonderful panelists, as well as a live Q&A towards the end. So we ask that you please keep your microphones muted and videos off during the entirety of this panel. If you would like to contribute to the Q&A portion by asking a question, we encourage you to use Zoom's chat box feature to automatically direct your message to me at any time during this event. Additionally, live caption is available at tinyurl.com slash pandemic parallel. This panel is the inaugural event for the COVID and Disability Lab as part of UCLA Disability Studies Inclusion Lab. The COVID-19 pandemic, as you know, has raised many questions about the ways we exist in the world. From how we use our bodies to where our bodies can go and interact with one another, life has drastically shifted, particularly for underserved populations, including people with disabilities. As the pandemic evolves, society as we know it continues to be reimagined. Today, we are fortunate to be joined by three panelists, each of whom have unique expertise and perspectives in order to contribute to this conversation. First off, I would like to introduce Professor Rosemary Garland Thompson. Rosemary, I believe you're muted. Thank you, Amy. Um, and thank you to my fellow panelists and all of the participants. I'm really delighted and honored to be able to be included in this um, really important set of conversations. So um, as Amy said, I'm Rosemary Garland Thompson. I am a professor of English and bioethics at Emory University which is in Atlanta, but I have close associations with the UCLA Disability Studies program. I was very happy to be able to teach a course a couple of years ago in disability bioethics and to have uh, given a lot of support in every way I can to the disability studies program at UCLA. So it's great to be here. Thank you. Next, I would like to welcome Professor Christina Palmer. Thank you, Amy. I am pleased to join this panel today as well. Uh, I'm a professor at UCLA in the Department of Psychiatry and Biobehavioral Sciences, the Department of Human Genetics, and the Institute for Society and Genetics. And I am a member of the Disability Studies Minor uh, Faculty Advisory Group. I'm also a licensed and board certified genetic counselor and the founding director of the new Master's in Science in Genetic Counseling graduate program at UCLA. My research has focused on, on providing a basis for improving educational, psychosocial, behavioral, and clinical outcomes of genetic counseling and genetic testing and to address disparities uh, in access to genetic information. My colleagues and I have conducted the only prospective longitudinal study to address the impact of genetic counseling for deaf gen and deaf genetic testing on deaf individuals in the deaf community using a culturally and linguistically sensitive genetic counseling model, and the first US funded deaf genetics grant to involve a multidisciplinary collaboration of, of culturally deaf, hard of hearing and hearing investigators. This work was significant because access to genetic information is uneven across populations and groups, for example, deaf sign language users. And our research addressed this disparity in order to increase access and improve health outcomes. Thank you. Thank you, Christina. Um, and finally, last but not least, I would like to introduce Dr. Neil Baer. Hello, thank you so much, Amy, and uh, welcome everyone. Thank you for attending zoom wise and virtually and i'm really pleased to be with uh, our panelists as well i'm a pediatrician and also a television writer and producer and i've done the shows er law and order special victims unit and most recently 
Designated Survivor on Netflix. And I was thinking about a character we created on ER in the late 90s, Carrie Weaver, played by Laura Innes, and she um, had a disability. And we had a lot of discussions back then about whether we should say what caused it or not, or just let her live her life and decide as a character herself, you know, whether she wanted to, to tell it. Now, of course, as writers, we had that control. And so, and she, she had a, a cane and she walked um, with some, you know, with a, a kind of, you know, it wasn't clear what caused her to, to, need the, to need the cane, but we just kind of left it that this was her decision to make as a character. And it was, we thought a fairly bold one at that point. Um, what we would do very differently now is we would hire an actor with that disability. And that was something that in the 90s was just starting to be talked about and understood. And so um, as I thought about that too, we also created a, a, a storyline where our character played by Eric LaSalle, Dr. Benton had a, a little boy who was born uh, deaf and he had to decide whether or not to um, give his, make the decision for his son to have a cochlear implant. And we hired two uh, actors, Marley Matlin and the late Phyllis Freelich. Marley's had uh, a cochlear implant. Phyllis Freelich had not. They both starred in Children of a Lesser God. Phyllis on Broadway, Marley won the Oscar for it. And so we were able to um, also interview doctors who had had cochlear implants and those who had hadn't. And those characters epitomized really for the first time on television that conversation about um, cochlear implants, the deaf community, um, and looking at deafness as um, human variability as opposed to necessarily a disability and how various folks had different opinions about it, even within the deaf community. And so that's why I love doing television because we're able to um, embrace uh, the diversity of people and also have these conversations. And I think we have come a long way. We still have far to go, but I think it would be very hard to hire an actor, let's say, for a role that is deaf who's not deaf. Just as we had a trans uh, character on our show this year and we hired a trans actor. And I think that's because we have learned from you all um, what is you know, really a question of social justice. So thanks. Wonderful. So thank you each again for our three panelists for joining us and sharing your expertise with us. So to start off, let's go ahead and explore the context of the pre-COVID-19 world. Disability studies scholarship and the disability rights and justice movements have newly emerged over the past several decades, as some of the panelists have alluded to. Rosemary, can you go ahead and provide us with some historical context about disability, as well as its influence on how pandemics have been mitigated over time? Yes, thank you, Amy. Um, of course, here we are in 2020 with a pandemic situation. And this gives us an opportunity to think about disability itself as a concept, as a way of being in the world and people with disabilities in new ways that we have not been able to think about before, certainly before in previous pandemics, such as the one that occurred almost 100 years ago um, throughout the world. And we're able to think about things like what constitutes disease. We're able to think about things like testing, medical commerce, which was not a topic that we were able to think about as clearly, let's say 100 years ago, or certainly even 50 years ago. We're able to think about vulnerability and about resource allocation in new ways. And this perspective that we're going to be considering today on justice and equality for people with disabilities could not have occurred in almost any other kind of healthcare crisis in national or even perhaps all of human history. And let me explain that a little bit more. So the concept, the very idea of disability justice or the idea of disability discrimination 
or even the idea of people with disabilities as a political and social minority simply did not exist anywhere in the world before the mid 20th century human rights, civil and human rights movements. For example, as I mentioned during the 1918 pandemic, what we think of now as people with disabilities would probably have been understood not as any kind of a social group, but rather as individual people who were ill, people who were unfortunate, people who may have been compromised in one way or another. They may have been understood as poor people. They may have been understood as sentimentalized people, but they would not have been understood as political subjects, as rights-bearing individuals in the way that we understand that now. And so this conversation um, about ethics or about equal treatment is only possible, as I've suggested, and I really want to emphasize this, because we have reconceptualized people with disability as a group, as a legal group, as an ethical group, but mostly as a legal and a social group that have been constituted through a variety of laws that came out of the civil and human rights movements. These laws began as early as 1968 with the Americans, uh, I'm sorry, with the uh, Architectural Barriers Act, which ramped the world, if you will, and continued through things like IDEA, which assured that people had the right, kids with disabilities in schools had the right to an equal and fair education. And of course, the Americans with Disabilities Act in 1990. And I'm really glad to hear Neil mention 1990 as a kind of watershed in the development of this idea of people with disabilities as political subjects instead of medical subjects. And also the development that came along with this that we think of as disability culture. In 1920, 1918, we certainly didn't have any kind of an idea of disability culture. We didn't have any kind of an idea of disability equality or diversity or an inclusion. And that is inflecting the way our conversations about this pandemic, about all of these topics are occurring for us. And these laws, and this is what's really important, these laws that we think of as disability rights laws, they are parallel and came along with a whole suite, if you will, of laws that were based on trying to provide equality to a number of different groups in the larger civil and human rights movement who had traditionally been excluded from the rights and privileges of liberal democracies. So we had the Black Civil Rights Movement, we had the Women's Movement, we had a nascent LGBTQ movement, and we had the Disability Rights Movement that all took place in the mid 20th century. And of course, this promise of increased inclusion and, and equality um, is an aspiration that is still unfulfilled, that we're working on all the time. And Neil gave a great example of this. And so in this way, I think the pandemic and the kinds of conversations around medical treatment and justice in relation to people with disabilities um, is really a terrific opportunity for us to move forward. Absolutely, thank you. Um, so speaking of medical treatment, uh, Neil, how does the field of public health and the concept of social determinants of health play into this? The social determinants of health has been a really good tool, I think, for helping us understand that it's not the person who is at fault or not strong enough or not smart enough uh, or it doesn't have the character to overcome uh, whatever the disability might be, or their gayness, or their uh, ethnicity. It is a way of looking at the world through a number of lenses and seeing what one's social determinants provide as 
barriers per se. So we look at, uh, for instance, um, a toxic environment, literally toxic, like a child with asthma who uh, is indigent and is exposed to factories, for instance, uh, we might blame the parents for this, this so-called you know, problem of theirs, but really it's a problem, it's a social societal problem because of um, lack of access to healthcare, where you live, a toxic environment, whether you can sleep well at night, whether you're exposed to, to um, antigens like cockroaches, which we know experimentally can increase uh, the risk of, of asthma in children. So we, we, we start to look at, as, instead of um, obesity is the problem of, of um, the person because they just can't control themselves, we look at obesity as the outcome of food access, advertising, um, promoting uh, high fat, high sugar, particularly foods that are inexpensive. And we begin to see that it's not just a matter of people's own choices and self-determination, but that the society itself has put up extreme boundaries and we can take you know, the barriers down for wheelchair access, which we've done, but we can't pat ourselves on the back and say that that is now allowing people access we have to really look at the social constructs that still um, bedevil those who have various disabilities and also still mark them as being at fault. And so no matter how we define disability, you, you know, that's also another social, social construct, is someone who is obese, disabled. We might say that now in this, this fat shaming culture, but we, in a way, social determinants say, hey, let's not just label people anymore. Let's see people as human beings who are diverse. Let's look at, as I said with deafness, um, that is human diversity. Let's look at you know, people who have autism or who are on the spectrum of autism. Let's think of them as neurologically diverse. And therefore, we're not, we're not blaming them or victimizing them. We're seeing them as full human beings and therefore should be able to participate fully. And let's look at the social structures that prevent them from doing it. And I think that we've come a long way in the world of medicine and the world of public health in thinking about those things. And now with COVID, it's going to, and I know we're going to be talking about this more, COVID has helped us to see in a really exciting way that we as people who may not see ourselves as disabled are now in the shoes of, disa of the disabled because we must stay away. We cannot go through the entrances that we're used to going through. We cannot congregate in the way that we're used to, maybe in, so in the way that somebody is very aware of when they're in a, a chair. So in a sense, it's, it's forced us in a way to confront the humanity of everyone in a fresh way, and I'm very excited about that. Absolutely. And it's interesting that you bring that up, the concept of identity, uh, because there is certainly a disproportionate impact on the way in which people with certain identities and disabilities um, and abilities are served uh, by both the healthcare system as well as the government. And this is reflected in access to healthcare, uh, healthcare professionals, clinical trials, certain medications, and research funding. Um, so, Rosemary, uh, can you tell us a little bit about the concept of subjective social value and how this plays into resource allocation on both the individual and the structural level? Yeah, and to, to go back to the historical context, which I think is very important, uh, this very idea that we all are of equal value uh, within a particular kind of community is very historically specific. And it's really a new and I would want to say a fragile concept that comes along in the last couple of centuries and that is the hallmark of what we think of as liberal democracies, these social orders that have emerged um, out, of, out of the consolidation and the growth of large nations over the last couple of hundred years. And it's fragile because we've had such a long history of hierarchies organizing 
societies. So we had social orders that were run by those who were imagined as representatives of some divine order that were thought to have more social value than other people. So these hierarchical social orders that have been more or less put to rest, especially in modern liberal democracies, have a long deep history. Um, it's very counterintuitive that everyone should have the same rights, that everyone should have equal social value. And part of really the development of our nation and many other liberal democracies has been to put together structures that carry out that promise, that really difficult promise of equality. And so it's hard for us to imagine that a person who appears to be biologically inferior, who appears to be different from what we think of as what I've called normates or um, a normal kind of person, normal in every way, say normal because they're non-disabled or normal because they're um, heterosexual or heteronormative, normal because they are of the ascendant racial group, normal because they are of the ascendant gender group. It's very hard for us to shed those long held, not so much beliefs, but traditions, and to try to imagine the real diversity and the real inclusion that is the promise of our liberal democratic orders. And so something like this pandemic really presses us, I think, to be able to reconceptualize that. And we have a disability rights movement, for example. We have a lot of other movements, but let me just talk about this because that's our topic here. That can press us into a kind of compliance to this promise. And it's led by people with disabilities and advocates and also people who recognize the importance of minority equality, if you will, and who are working to bring forward these issues now, for example, to bring lawsuits against the states which had discriminatory language in their guidelines for resource allocation during a pandemic. So that's been happening really a lot. And so we're being forced to recognize our inherent tradition of unequal social value. And that's being challenged in, I think, really productive ways. Absolutely. Um, so Christina, turning to you, um, still on the concept of subjective social value and resource allocation, how has this affected the field of genetic counseling? Subjective social value is an important concept because there are disproportionate impacts on the way in which people with certain identities and abilities are served uh, by the healthcare and by the government. I wanna just give the definition of genetic counseling for a second here. The, the, the definition of genetic counseling is to help people understand and adapt to the medical, psychological, and familial implications of genetic contributions to disease. The process integrates the interpretation of family and medical histories to assess the chance of disease occurrence or recurrence, education about inheritance, testing, management, prevention, resources, and research, and counseling to promote informed choices and adaptation to the risk or condition. Well, the genetic contributions to disease is often ascertained through genetic testing. However, there is a significant disparity in access to informative genetic information as a function of ancestral background, and this then would affect genetic counseling. 
To date, much of what is known about human DNA variation, whether a variant is a condition causing variant or not, is based on the accumulation and, and investigation of DNA samples from individuals of predominantly Northern European and white ancestry, ancestral backgrounds. Thus, when individuals of underrepresented ancestral backgrounds have genetic testing, they're more likely to receive uninformative genetic test results because DNA variants observed in their sample are less likely to have been investigated to determine if they're associated with a condition or not. Disparity in our understanding of DNA variants could have significant implications for individuals potentially at risk for conditions such as inherited cancers, inherited cardiac conditions, et cetera. So you might ask, why is there such disparity in our knowledge about DNA variants in some groups and not other groups? And there's likely a number of factors, including structural racism, which is an implementation of subjective social value that have resulted in mistrust by non-majority groups of the goals of research or the researchers and or the use of the products of research. And this mistrust has affected non-majority groups' participation in research, including genetics research. And so, of course, then the snowballs, cascades into um, uh, the potential for health disparities because less information then is known that could be informative for their health care. There are efforts underway, even currently, such as the All of Us Research Project, to engage underrepresented groups in genomic research to better understand DNA variation so as to provide informative genetic information via genetic counseling to all individuals and reduce health disparities. But it's, it's really, it's an incredible effort um, that really requires uh, a, a change of mindset on researchers' um, points of view and how they engage with research and engage with communities, uh, non-majority communities. Absolutely, thank you. Um, so Neil, turning to you as a medical doctor, how have you seen this, these ideas affecting both the healthcare and the research field? So interestingly, a study just came out. Uh, I don't know if you've seen it, Christina. It just, it just came out. We've always thought that stature, at least genetically, is controlled by uh, a number of genes, and each one contributes very little to stature itself. And a group went down to Peru and they uh, took the blood of coast, coastal Peruvians. And they found the first gene that does not come up in Northern Europeans that tamps down stature by almost two inches. And it was a shocking finding because they just, to Christina's point, hadn't looked. And so now they understood, and this is um, a gene that is uh, seen in 1% of Native, Native American population. And the Pacific uh, coastal uh, Peruvians are um, separated geographically from Andes Peruvians as well, and so who are taller. So it's really interesting that it's taken until 2020 to understand height which we thought we understood quite well. And now we have the first gene that really is quite you know, remarkable in that it, it, can, it confers much more than what we thought genetically. So to Christina's point, there's so much we don't know because we haven't looked. And then the question is, why haven't we looked? And the answer is because we are driven to look possibly at the people we feel most we have felt in the past most comfortable with. But I think that this, this finding is really going to push uh, people to really reconsider how we've been looking um, because it was always there. And I think that will have medical implications. So what are the medical implications? That, then we start to talk about diseases that Christina knows much more about in terms, in terms of uh, families than I, but Marfan's, for instance, a disease about height and, and, and that can, can cause cardiac problems. So we can, we can understand more about uh, genetic Ill, uh, diseases when we look again at, now this is to Rosemary's point, the collection of people, not just the sp specific people we're used to looking at. 
Thank you. Um, so clearly from genetic counseling to public health and sociology to disability and bioethics, each and every one of you do have unique insight into how this COVID-19 pandemic has influenced your respective fields. Um, so how has the pandemic exposed these cracks in the system and highlighted issues that didn't used to get the public's attention in the past? Christina, why don't we start with you? You know, the COVID-19 pandemic has exposed lack of access to genetic counseling as a significant problem as hospitals mitigate the spread of the virus by delivering remote healthcare services. Historically, access to genetic counseling and genetic services was limited by the small number of trained genetic counselors. The modern field of genetic counseling is relatively new with the first graduating class in the United States in the early 1970s. Over the years, more graduate programs have developed with the expansion in the last five to 10 years to something like maybe 52 accredited programs in the US right now. And there are currently about 5,000 board certified genetic counselors in the United States. So while the number of genetic counselors will grow, there are other important factors or returning to the topic of social determinants of health that affect access to genetic counseling services such as language, location where an individual lives, and income. The dominant genetic counseling model has been face-to-face, in-person encounters in a clinic space. This can affect access because it requires individuals and families to travel to what is likely an unfamiliar setting during what might be an emotional time for some of them. While many individuals and families living relatively near the clinic setting are, might be able to accommodate this mode of delivery, it may not always be easy for them and they, may not, and they may prefer more familiar locations. In my collaborative research examining deaf individuals' interest in and responses to genetic counseling and genetic testing for deaf genes, we found clear differences in preferences for genetic counseling location based on language and culture. ASL using culturally deaf individuals preferred to meet with a genetic counselor in a deaf community location such as a deaf residential school. And English using deaf individuals preferred to meet with a genetic counselor in a, in a medical setting. These location preferences may explain in part why few culturally deaf individuals schedule appointments to meet with a genetic counselor in a clinic setting, which can create healthcare disparities when there may be significant family history for an inherited medical condition, such as inherited forms of cancer, that could be addressed by a genetic counselor and could reduce morbidity and mortality. Access has been further compounded by a relative concentration of genetic counselors in larger cities, and that individuals living in more rural areas need to travel sometimes considerable distance for services. In some states, genetic counselors and other healthcare providers have tried to address this access issue with satellite clinics where the clinic team periodically travels to a clinic in another part of the state and meets with individuals or families there. Now in more recent times, genetic counseling service delivery models have expanded to include telephone counseling, which can increase genetic counseling by uh, access to genetic counselors by allowing for remote or non-clinic based services, and to telehealth, which can also increase access to genetic counselors by allowing for remote or non-clinic based services. However, until the COVID-19 pandemic, use of telehealth was generally low, even though evidence demonstrates that high quality genetic services can be delivered effectively through telehealth. So the pandemic has altered, perhaps forever, and likely for the better, access to genetic counseling services by forcing services to be provided by telehealth in order to protect the community from the spread of the virus. Relevant government agencies suspended policies that had perhaps that had the perhaps unintended consequence of restricting use of telemedicine and medical institutions implemented changes almost overnight to enact broad use of, tele, of telehealth. It was not necessarily easy and the changes required substantial coordinated efforts with IT, but based on a recent webinar that I attended, the outcomes have generally been positive in terms of the large numbers of telehealth appointments that have been possible and patient appreciation to be able to have appointments while at home. So almost overnight, this virtual service delivery has become the norm 
increasing access to genetic counseling services to individuals who simply by location or by language or by underlying health conditions were afforded less access to these services in the past. So while it will probably take some time to fully examine the benefits and pitfalls of genetic counseling via telehealth, I think it's here to stay and that genetic services will embrace a hybrid model of offering virtual appointments and in-person appointments, depending on individual circumstances, and that this expansion of options will address at least some social determinants of health and reduce health disparities. A final point, as with all healthcare in the United States, access to genetic counseling, to, to, to genetic counselors and services can be affected by income and insurance. Medicare laws and regulations do not recognize genetic counselors as providers, and this prevents genetic counselors from delivering services by telehealth to Medicare beneficiaries. Thus, as genetic counselors shift to telehealth, Medicare beneficiaries may have emergent needs that go unaddressed. And there are efforts underway to address this issue. It's been a long haul. Thank you. Thank you, Christina. Um, so again, speaking to the topic of how the COVID-19 pandemic has exposed these cracks in the system, um, Neil, what's your perspective on this issue? Well, what's been really stunning is uh, the differential way that COVID has affected uh, morbidity and mortality. So someone, say, who has uh, a genetic uh, syndrome like cystic fibrosis is, of course, much more at risk for COVID because they have a condition that affects their lungs and that's what COVID attacks. Also, uh, African Americans in the United States are three and a half times more likely to have kidney disease. And we know that people who have kidney disease or high, hypertension, which is very closely related to kidney disease, are at much higher risk for morbidity and mortality. We also know that African Americans and Latinos are also at much higher risk, uh, particularly African Americans. And this gets us back again to the social determinants of health. Why is it that we have to really ask ourselves? And I think COVID has, has you know, ripped the curtain off, the, off this, this issue that we have maybe been able to not look at in the past. It's not that anything has really changed in terms of healthcare uh, provisions. It's just that COVID has made it really clear what's happening and, and to whom it's happening. Um, so, I think that one, we're going to have to really look at the disparities in healthcare now because COVID has pointed them out. And it's a matter of access, it's a matter of um, access to food, nutrition. Uh, you know, it's such, again, a, pan a panoply of, of social determinants that affect one's health. It's not just one's own actions, and it's, the locus is not simply a matter of the choices people have made. So that's one thing. Secondly, what's, what's amazing and astonishing about COVID is, is that it's an invisible enemy, so to speak, and it puts everyone at risk. And we do not know enough genetically to understand who will be at risk and who will not be. So if we, there was an op-ed I read yesterday by two physicians who also are uh, public health uh, experts and they argue that children should go back to school because their noses and throats are not um, as developed with the cells that can um, uh, harbor COVID. And they said, as, as I'm seeing quite often in the literature now as an aside, and yes, four, 400 to 500 children do uh, contract a Kawasaki-like syndrome that causes severe inflammation of their arterial system and their hearts. So then we get into this situation where, we, one, we don't know who will be at risk yet, so it can be anybody. And just simply saying that young people or children are less at risk doesn't mean that those people are going to be safe. Two, we don't understand fully how COVID is transmitted, particularly amongst people who are asymptomatic. So you're going out because you want your freedom um, can still infect somebody who is vulnerable. So I think it's in a way helping us to understand what our community responsibility is to those who are vulnerable. And um, 
it's making us see that it's not just about our own families, but our actions do have repercussions in the community if we go out and we're asymptomatic. Third, what's really interesting is that it's pushing this notion, um, uh, a utilitarian uh, idea of the greatest good, that because the economy is sinking, the greatest good is that grandma can die because her value is less than someone who's 20 years old. So we're starting to make these, these um, value assessments that I think are, are very frightening and very problematic and really speak to that word that Rosemary used, which is the fragility of where we are now. And so we get into the situation where bioethicists are arguing that young people can, should be able to um, volunteer for vaccine challenge experiments, meaning that they'll be uh, given a vaccine at, or a placebo. And then, ex and then those who are exposed to uh, COVID who didn't get the vaccine might get sick. And they say, as an, you know, as an addition, well, we'll give them rescue treatments. We don't have rescue treatments. We have remdesivir that does not rescue you. It may shorten your stay. And there's no real concrete proof about plasma. Um, so we don't have that. If it were malaria, we could say, yes, we have medications and those kinds of experiments have been done. But the way that this was justified was by saying that um, since young people, 18 to 29, have the lowest uh, mortality rate, or so we think, um, they should be allowed to make this decision. And what's a few people dying to save a million? So we're getting into this kind of utilitarian greatest good. And that really frightens me because then it's getting into the situation of ventilators. Well, grandma's 88 and somebody else is 22 and they have their life ahead of them. So, you know, what, you know, is the choice that we make and why should we be making those choices? What is wrong with the system that has, is forcing us to make these choices? So I think it's, it's, a, it's a grand time for us to really start to think about what we value, whom we value, how we value them, and how we're going to change things so that this doesn't put us into those, this situation again. Most definitely. Thank you, Neil. Um, and building right off of that, Rosemary, what are your thoughts on this as a bioethicist? I'm glad Neil brought up this very unsettling and very current question um, that we're all thinking a lot about, and that is who gets a ventilator when there aren't enough ventilators to go around for everyone who needs one. And this is the classic bioethical dilemma, moral dilemma, basically, that bioethicists have been talking about for years and years and years. But this has simply been brought into focus by the imbalance between need and availability of medical technology. Um, and it's causing a lot of what we call moral distress for healthcare workers and for everybody else. But in, in a sense, this question of what we're calling resource allocation now is a much larger question that we have been struggling with as liberal democracies um, for a long, long time. Um, and we might go back to, say, the Holocaust, which, of course, is the event that gave us bioethics. And I can talk a little bit more about that later. One way of thinking about the Holocaust is that it is a, the most um, extreme, the most large scale, and the most modern initiative about resource allocation that we as a human community have ever seen. So the logic, the eugenic logic of the Holocaust was in response to the question of who do we want to have in our community? So Nazi Germany had a government that insisted that only a certain kind of person was valuable and acceptable within that community. And that was an Aryan kind of person. And they went about controlling who got what kinds of resources. They went about 
carrying out what we call positive and negative eugenics. So negative eugenics was to kill everyone that they didn't want in the community. Everyone that had a low social value, they actually used terms like that. And to encourage and to give resources to the people that they felt had a high social value. So this was an extreme example of distributing resources, food, medicine, housing, any kind of possibility for life-sustaining resources to the people that they felt deserved those things and to withhold them from the people that they felt didn't deserve these things. And if we look at what we're doing here, what we're thinking about in this way, and we use the example of the eugenic euthanasia, if you will, and the eugenic distribution of resources that the Nazis carried out politically and in terms of aggression, I think we can have a clearer understanding of what's wrong with the idea of saying, we might as well let all these old people go because they don't matter. And that we might be able to think about what a real non-utilitarian, real equitable, very just distribution of resources might look like. Thank you, Rosemary. Um, and as a reminder to our audience members, if you would like to pose a question um, during our Q&A at the end, please directly message me um, using the chat box that you can find on the lower right-hand side of your screen. Um, that being said, our final question before this audience Q&A, I would like to explore the idea of the future. Now, much talk about the future has centered around whether or not we as a society will return back to this idea of normal. Now, on the other hand, UCLA Disability Studies tagline is redefine normal. So in that sense, in what ways do you see the COVID-19 pandemic being an opportunity to positively shape the future of folks with disabilities? Um, and Neil, we'll start with you, followed by Christina, and last but not least, Rosemary. You know, I, I always have a problem with the word normal because what was normal before, I don't want to go back to, to you know, as I was saying and pointing out all the cracks in the system, all the people who are suffering, that was the normal. And I don't know what a new normal is. Is that like uh, accepting it in a new way? I think it's a, a, you know, it's a new, it's a new chance. It's a reset. It's a, I think a new chance helps us say, wow, we've seen who was affected, who was most at risk, how we're all in this together because we can actually cause someone's demise because we haven't sheltered in place, used a mask, um, and uh, uh, maintained social distance. So I think it's, an, it's a new chance. It's an eye-opening experience. And I think we as advocates and storytellers have to tell those stories now to keep it going because I think it's there now in the in the zeitgeist and i want to be able to not go back to the same kind of normal which is cars everywhere difficulty breathing and, and you know people are amazed that in, in delhi for instance that they're seeing what the city looks like or they're seeing the himalayas you know in nepal i mean it's just it's just an incredible re rebirth in a way it's a new chance a second chance and it has a huge impact on global warming as well because we've seen in many places that we can get along with things that we thought we couldn't get along with and so how do we reestablish um, new ways to use spaces uh, everybody now is concerned about going in as i said earlier through entrances how is that going to reshape the way that we think about entrances for everybody because now we've all been there um, how is this going to make us think about how we get around just in the world day to day because now we've all been there. So I hope that it's increased our empathy. 
because we need empathy as the gateway to um, change. And if we're, if we're not empathetic, then we haven't taken in the other person's challenges. But this is, I think, hope, hope, I hope, and I believe it's caused an increase in empathy. And now we have to continue down that, that path, not for a new normal, but for uh, a second chance. I agree with Neil that the pandemic has uh, shifted our understanding of disability and who is at risk to develop a condition um, from simply applying to a subgroup of the population to applying to the entire population. And, and I also agree that this is an opportunity for individuals to further cultivate or develop empathy. Empathy is defined as the ability to share and understand the feelings of another. So for example, for someone who has never been immunocompromised to develop empathy for individuals who are immunocompromised who, and whose lived experiences have included aspects of physical distancing even before the pandemic. Empathy is an important component of healthcare quality and essential for providing patient-centered care. Empathy is an innate quality that is malleable. It's developed through experiences that give insight into the lived experience of another. So in addition to the pandemic's potential for further developing empathy in healthcare providers, including genetic counselors, I think there's another aspect of the pandemic that has the opportunity to positively shape the future of individuals with disabilities. Again, going back to increased access to genetic counseling through telehealth, I think that means that genetic counselors will likely have increased inter, in, interpersonal contact with diverse individuals, including individuals with disabilities. And some research studies have found that interpersonal contact with individuals who are different from yourself uh, has, a, has um, a distinct impact on empathy and that this contributes to improved attitudes towards others, for example, individuals with disabilities. And this can enhance patient-provider relationships, reduce, reduce health disparities, and promote diversity, equity, and inclusion, which the extent to the, that this pandemic is serving these functions, I think is a good thing. Thank you. Well, the categories of being that we think of now as normal and abnormal have been used really over the last couple of centuries to sort people into groups um, that have had a lot of important social implications uh, for everyone. And I think that this great equalizer that we are all at risk, we are all at risk of moving from what we think of as a category of the normal, the healthy, the well, into the category of the disabled, the ill, the unfortunate. That recognition, uh, that way of understanding ourselves can have really profound effects on um, the calcification of these two categories because a great deal has been, a great deal of violence has been enacted in the name of normal and normalization um, over the last two centuries, particularly over the last century. A great deal of eugenic work has been carried out uh, by not allotting resources to people understood as abnormal, uh, a lot of resources have been provided for those people understood as normal. A great deal of resources have been devoted and energy have been devoted to valuing and to attaining normalcy, to becoming normal. And I think there's a possibility that this equalizing um, this reduction of the real strong disparity that we carry psycho-emotionally and structurally with us um, can be called in question 
And I hope that that happens and that I hope that the results are positive for us and that can lead to the kinds of empathy, the kinds of identification across categories that Christina is in, invoking here. So um, maybe the kinds of work that we're all doing here together can help that one little bit. Thank you. Um, and speaking from personal experience, um, as someone who is severely immunocompromised and, and has an immune disease, um, it has been a really interesting um, time that we're living in now. Um, I'm only 21 years old, and so I do fall into that category um, that Neil was referring to earlier as, you know, people don't necessarily think like, oh, that's the lowest risk group. If you're young, you're okay and immune to the disease, and that's simply not true. Um, and so I just want to reemphasize kind of all of your points that you brought up about um, empathy and awareness that's being cultivated um, through the pandemic. Um, and thank you all for, for those responses. Um, now, I, I did want to, um, I know we're kind of coming right up um, on our 3 p.m. time, um, but I did want to bring up um, a question that was posed uh, by one of our audience members. Um, what, as a disabled person, um, can I do to help continue uh, getting people to see their community responsibility, um, as you all were kind of referencing earlier? So tell your story. Uh, I think that is the most power powerful thing we all have. And I often, when I, when I teach medical students or students in public health, the first thing I ask them is, why are you here? And they all start to think and they tell me stories. I say, well, you're not selling real estate. I mean, maybe you are to su you know, support your, your tuition, but you're not in banking and you're not in various other industries. You're in public health or you're in medicine or you're in nursing. What happened? Why? Tell me the story. And so if you have a disability, you have many stories to tell that are moving and emotional. And, and we have a lot of research on this that shows that people are not moved by data. If, um, I really like the work of, of a, a psychologist at uh, the University of Oregon named Paul Slovic, who writes that uh, and has done many studies that if you can tell the story of one, just think about when the turtle uh, the sea turtle had the straw up its nostril and that caused you know people around the country to lobby to get rid of plastic straws they were moved by the one an animal or a person but if i tell you there are eight million eight billion tons of plastic in the ocean you just go wow there's nothing i can do so what you have is yourself and you have your story and you can tell that story in more and more ways as we're um, expanding the way that we use social media from blogging to writing op-eds. We had, I had 17 of my students in a course at Harvard that I just taught, who I believe did almost like the first crowdsourced op-ed where they wrote um, for USA Today. And so it's almost, you know, it's, it's a little bit scary to step into that world, but choose a storytelling modality that you're comfortable with. And it doesn't have to be the traditional you know, I have to be a TV writer. I'm fortunate to be one, but you can write poetry. There are so many ways now to podcasting, getting out your story. And who, who better to tell that story than the audience member who asked that question or all of you? I'd like to follow up a little bit with that um, by reminding us that up until the mid 20th century, most people with disabilities, significant disabilities, or what I call legible disabilities, were locked out of things. They were locked up in homes, they were locked up in institutions, they certainly weren't in school, they certainly weren't in jobs, they certainly were not in places where they could have opportunities to have flourishing lives. And one of the things that has come out 
of this desegregation movement, this integration movement, this movement toward inclusion is what I call disability culture. And this is what Neil's talking about uh, when there are conversations about how a person with a disability is portrayed in a television program or any kind of an aesthetic narrative. Uh, there is so much vibrant culture produced by and about people with disabilities now, whether it's the stories that Neil's talking about or television programs or dance or uh, art. And these pieces of disability culture can help us revalue as a community the lives of people with disabilities and the contributions that everyone, whether they're non-disabled or disabled, make in the world to one another and to our institutions. Absolutely, thank you. Um, Christina, anything to add before we move on to our second and final audience question? No, I think that Neil and Rosemary um, words were completely aligned with what I would have to say. Perfect. Thank you. Um, so now kind of combining a few questions here. Um, we really today have discussed um, how COVID-19 has revealed the underside of structural discrimination in terms of the way that we value um, or not value human life. Um, and along with that, um, it has really revealed, as we were talking about, numerous cracks in the system um, and limited resources um, available to us as a society. Um, so for you know, our audience wondering, uh, what are some concrete actions uh, beyond cultivating empathy that we can take in order to move towards this idea um, concretely towards equity and justice? So I think voting, <laughs> getting out the vote uh, so that uh, we have empathy again, or, or at least we try to have empathy uh, since we have a president who has none. And I think that's really critical that we have to really, something concrete to do is we have the power to change that if we get out enough votes. So it's, I think it's incumbent on us to make sure that people who don't have access are allowed to vote. So here again is a question that is really obscured by all of this talk about uh, mail-in voting and, and fraud. It's that there are lots of people who can only vote because they have mail-in uh, voting or it's convenient, it's, it's beyond convenience, it's because they have to work and they can't sacrifice uh, missing a day of work to go vote. So we have to think, I think this, this question of voting is really interesting because under, underlying it are issues of disability, are issues of access, are, you know, here we go again. It's like we can find it in, in so many ways that we don't often possibly think about it. So just as a, on a concrete level, we're, having, we're going to have a lot of discussion about mail-in voting. So I think you know, that's an issue that really speaks to uh, people with disabilities. And it speaks to single parent mothers, and it speaks to people who can't get off work. And so I think that we can, we can really use the power of our lives to um, promote equity. And so that would just be one concrete way because that's to, you know, change the political system as much as much power as, as we have, which is in our vote. I have often thought that um, I didn't like or use the word compliance very often uh, because I prefer carrots to sticks. But in this environment, I think compliance has um, a new possible productive set of meanings. 
uh, compliance with wearing masks, compliance with social distancing, uh, compliance with um, ADA requirements, compliance with things like seeking out anti-discrimination uh, or discriminatory statutes where they where they are. For example, uh, the disability rights groups that brought suit against the state of Alabama because the guidelines for ventilator distribution said that a person with mental retardation was not going to get a ventilator. And those folks at those disability discrimination law folks, in one second, they were all over that. And so this concept of complying for the, for the common good um, <laughs> has new legs in this unprecedented novel environment. So let's all comply together. I guess I, I think about higher education and access to higher education. And, um, and I think that's an area where um, obviously uh, uh, emphasis on diversity, equity, and inclusion is so important. And, and, and I think the more diverse our, our cohorts of students become, the, the more that, you know, some of these um, systemic problems that we have will dissolve. And I've been emphasizing disability justice and disability equity a lot, but I also want to follow up on Christina's point, and that is that uh, diversity and inclusion initiatives, uh, knowledge making and knowledge dissemination initiatives in higher education or in education in general are always what we call intersectional. So that we, we can't effectively work toward what we think of as disability justice without at the same time working toward and thinking about racial justice and gender justice and uh, queer justice. Uh, and, and that these all are part of the same moral and political and social agenda. And there is not a better place for the logic of this to be put forward than in educational institutions that participate in these kinds of interdisciplinary initiatives, participate in making them and bringing them forward. So, and thank you, UCLA Disability Studies. Wonderful. Um, thank you so much um, to our, our three panelists. And I would just like to add to um, the idea of intersectionality, um, equity, diversity really helps us in grappling with not just having a seat at the table, but having a voice at that table. Um, and I think today's discussion really started cultivating all of these thoughts and ideas um, so that together we can really work um, to make the future more accessible. Um, so I'd like to, again, thank our three panelists for joining us, um, as well as all of you in the audience. Um, I really appreciate um, all of the time that you've spent with us today. I know we did go over, um, but hopefully that was a little bit more food for thought. Um, and just as a reminder, we will be uploading a recording of this presentation to the UCLA Disability Studies website um, with closed captioning as well. So you can keep your eyes out for that um, over the next couple of weeks. But on behalf of the Disability Studies minor, I would like to thank you all for joining us today. And again, thank you so much to our panelists. Have a wonderful rest of your day, everyone.